Hello everybody. Thank you for joining us this evening for this IFATO workshop brought to you by Astral Aviation Consulting on behalf of the UK Civil Aviation Authority. If you'd like to stay in the loop with events and resources, please sign up to our mailing list. You can do this by going to our website www.astralaviationconsulting.com or use the link that will be appearing in your chat box shortly. Signing up also gives you access to the replay for this workshop and a whole host of other safety resources. This evening, I'm joined by Matt Lane and Nigel Wilson. Matt is the head of training and an active single and multi-engine FI and FE. Nigel is also a head of training in FI and an FE and is also a display pilot. He also runs Easy PPL Ground School, which provides online courses for student pilots, licensed pilots, instructors, and training organizations. Over the course of the next hour, we'll break the workshop down into easily digestible chunks. We're gonna cover what an Afato actually is, actions in the event of an Afato, an interactive scenario section, some top tips, and then finally, as always, it'll be time for Q&A, which we'd love you to take part in. So if you do have any questions, please do add them to the Q&A box, which is separate to the chat box. So to kick us off, I'd like to find out if any of you are affiliated to any flying organization. This is so we can make sure that we can help ensure all of our links with organizations and individuals are maintained to make sure you get the very best and most up-to-date information at all times. So here we go. Here's your first poll. Here's your first interactivity. Let me know, please, if you're affiliated to any of those you can see on the screen, a local flying club, a large organization, or both of them, or nothing at all. That really will help us direct our communications um, and reach as many people as possible. While you're doing that, let's talk about the chat box. We'd love to hear from you this evening. So let us know where you're, where you're signing in from, uh, where you're watching this webinar from. We tend to cover the breadth and uh, length of the UK. Um, I'm personally flying out of sleep at the moment, so it'd be great to see some people from sleep on there. So yeah, let us know. Great, let's have a look at the answer for poll number one then. Cool, so we've got loads, well, 41% of local flying club, 9% with a large organization, uh, pretty much an even split there between just the local flying club and both, and then 10% with none at all. So thanks ever so much for that, it's really helpful. Great, right, so we're gonna get into the meat of this now. So I'm gonna start with Matt, who's gonna tell us all about what Nefato actually is. Over to you, Matt. Thanks, Chris. Uh, hello. Good evening, everybody. Uh, very cold, damp here in West Oxfordshire, but good to see uh, a good spread of people from all over and a, a few names that I recognise popping up there as well. So uh, welcome to everybody. Um, before we get into detail on this section, uh, as always, we can start with a poll just to get people thinking about that as well. So let's have a look at our first poll in the, the thing. So interested to see what do you think is roughly what proportion of UK GA occurrence reports are related to engine failures, stroke malfunctions. So that's UK GA occurrence reports and which of them are related to engine failures malfunctions. So we've got choices 10%, 20%, 30% or 5%. So what do you reckon is that percentage? Have a guess. Uh, and I'll give you uh, some info on uh, on what we think the answer is. 10, 20, 30 or 5 percent. Hopefully most of you have had a good opportunity to do that. So we'll move on to the answer, please. From there, let's have a look what people thought. The answer is actually 20 percent. And that's based on 841 GA occurrence reports between November 2021 and April 2023. Uh, there are 170, and that's credit to some GASCO analysis on there as well. So it's actually about 20% uh, out of the, there as well. So some people thought it was a little bit lower than that. Some people thought it was relatively low, but yeah, 20%. So the key thing here is it is significant. And this is why, of course, uh, engine failures have to take off uh, as such a threat in our flying and why we're dedicated a whole workshop to it indeed. So let's uh, move on then and let's have a look at what an Afato is and why is it so dangerous. So firstly, what flight regime are we talking about? Well, really, we're talking about the start of the takeoff roll to notionally about a thousand foot AGL. That's the flight regime we're talking about. 
And in this phase of flight, a light aircraft really is at their most vulnerable stage of flight because they're shortly after takeoff and in the initial climb. The aircraft's short of energy, its momentum is low due to the slow speed, and potential energy is low due to the lack of height. Should, or indeed the engine or one of the engines fail, suddenly at this stage, speed could decay quite rapidly to stalling speed, and you will have little chance of recovering it within a minimal height available unless prompt action is to be taken. So this is why it is quite a threat and quite a dangerous regime of flight should something go wrong. So why could we get an engine failure then? Well, I'm going to show you, but if you like to think about it in this respect, there's four main generic causes of an engine failure after takeoff. Firstly, fuel. This could be due to contamination, potentially a fuel quality issue, starvation, i.e. fuel is not getting to the engine from the tanks, or exhaustion. So there's no fuel left in the tank there, or indeed some kind of potential mechanical or electrical pump failure as well could also be preventing the fuel. Spark, as we called it there, um, that's the system that provides the spark to the spark plugs. It may not be functioning correctly or, or not at all. Air, we could be talking about an intake blockage, you know, bird's nest, bird strike, fog, or a hose, um, crunched or uh, damaged or hold, or a mechanical failure as well. A total or partial failure of an engine component leading to a loss of power. And this includes the propeller in this as well. Maybe if you've had an actual engine failure and you know from a report or from the investigation, the actual cause of the aparto, perhaps drop it in the chat box. Uh, or I'd be interested to know what people have actually experienced out there as well. My only uh, total full engine failure in a Cessna 152 was a mechanical. It was a, a failure, uh, a crankshaft failure. That's the only full one that I, I've had personally. So let's move on to types of power loss then. I don't want to get too, uh, too detailed or too, um, you know, I don't want to preach at you here as well, but you might be thinking, power loss malfunction what is he talking about here it's an engine failure surely well this is just my little suggestion of how you may want to think about either in your teaching or your recurrent training or some ground school about how to define engine problems so we've got three legs and you can think about it like a decision tree if you're engineered by background by training like i am decision tree kind of makes a lot of sense to you um is it a mechanical failure and these will be things like the propeller stops, lots of oil loss, big mechanical noise. Is it a non-mechanical failure? The propeller might still be rimbling, you might be here experiencing some rough running, or you might just have an RPM drop. Or have you actually got signs of a fire, flames, smoke, or things like that? Now, it may help to channel your responses. And what I've suggested there along the bottom is in your decision making, if you've got a mech failure or a fire, are you really going to attempt to restart it or diagnose it? Probably not. If you've got a non-mechanical failure, you may want to think about a restart. But of course, remember, Nigel will come on to this in detail, we're talking about engine failures after takeoff, so time is going to be very critical in that. So that restart or diagnosis, that's going to be a very difficult decision to make because you may have very limited time on that. But that's just something that you can think about for engine malfunctions, and that works whether you're in the Afato regime or at height, or in the cruise, or, or whatever. In particular, as I'd like to highlight that the non-mechanical failure could result in a partial loss of power. This is a very, very topical issue, and we're going to come back to that, and we welcome your questions on that as we go through the workshop as well. Now, at this stage, I should also quickly mention the startle effect. And this is both physical and mental responses to a sudden, unexpected stimulus. While the physical responses are automatic and virtually instantaneous, those mental responses, the conscious processing and evaluation of your senses, can be much slower. And in fact, the ability to process the sensory information, that is evaluating the situation and taking appropriate action, that can be seriously impaired, that ability, or even overwhelmed by the intense psychological responses. Now, studies have determined but following a startling stimulus such as an Afate, basic motor response performance, i.e. actually flying and doing things, 
can be disrupted for as much as three seconds and performance of more complex motor tasks can be impacted for up to 10 seconds. Now, it doesn't sound a lot, but a lot can happen in that time, especially if you're down at low level. Now, if you're more interested in reading about the startle effect, there's a really good article on Skybury, and Chloe's going to put the link in the chat box for that, uh, and you might be something you'd like to read up on as well, but it's very relevant to how we deal with the Fartos, and Nigel, I know, is very much going to touch on this uh, as I hand over to him now for the next section. Over to you, Nigel. Okay, thanks very much. So just before we get started on that, let's have another quick poll. So uh, the question is, what do you think is the highest priority action to take in the event of an engine failure at takeoff or on takeoff? So is it A, make that mayday call, or B, uh, tell the passengers to brace, or is it C, pitch to the best glide speed for the current configuration? Or is it D, securing the aircraft? And by that, we mean perform the crash drill checks. So there you go. Uh, make a mayday call, tell the passengers to brace, pitch to the best glide speed, or do the crash drills. So let's have a quick look and see what we had then, uh, because the answer was, in fact, C. Uh, and we're going to come on to that. and encouraging to see that just about everybody got that one correct so that's really good well done so um we talked about uh pitching to the best glide speed in the current configuration because of course remember that sometimes the glide speed varies depending on whether you've got some flaps down and some aircraft have flaps or are down for takeoff so we'll touch on that a bit later on so let's have a look at uh actions that we can take in the event of a failure then. So there's a number of things that we can do if your engine fails after takeoff. So let's uh, talk about that initially. So basically the priority, as we said on the screen there, is to fly the aeroplane. So we need to keep the aircraft flying. So we, as a priority, must pitch to the best glide speed, as we said, for the uh, current configuration. And in most aircraft, that means a significant and rapid pitch down on the control is required, okay? So that may well be counterintuitive if an engine failure occurs at a low altitude, because when you do that, you're gonna pretty much fill the windscreen with the ground. It's a very, it looks like a very different attitude compared to what you would select at altitude. So once we've got the speed achieved, we don't wanna waste time trimming. You haven't got a lot of time here. So um, you really should now be looking for the best place to land from the selection that's available. So preferably 30 degrees each side of the nose and ideally the side that is most in to wind if the departure was with a crosswind. So you need to be swift and positive in your decision making here. That's really key. And remember, if you don't pick a field, the aeroplane will. <laughs> and your choice is probably going to be more preferable than the one the aircraft picks. So if we do need to bank slightly at higher bank angles to reach our, our, our field, you know, really a maximum of 45 degrees, if you really must, then don't forget to also increase that glide speed slightly. Uh, remember those steep gliding turns you did way back in your skills test. So Ultimately, it's often going to be the case that you're not going to have a suitable field for a completely safe forced landing. So in which case, what you really should be aiming to do is to get the aircraft on the ground the right way up and into your postage stamp sized field. And generally speaking, once you're on the ground, you can survive collisions with hedges, fences and trees. What you don't want to do is fly into those things or lose control and stall from altitude. So you probably won't have time to do the same checks as uh, you do with a normal force landing, as Matt alluded to, from altitude. Uh, you'll need to do some, some abbreviated shutdown checks. So don't try to work out what's gone wrong. You just won't have time usually. And one good mantra might be MFI, you know, that good furniture store. Uh, <laughs> MFI mixture to idle cutoff, fuel uh, off again to fuel cutoff and ignition. In other words, the magnetos or the ignition source, turn that off too. 
So yes, in an engine failure after takeoff situation, we actually don't want the aircraft, sorry, the engine to restart on us. Uh, if you think about it, if it's like a fuel starvation problem, and when we bank the aeroplane left and right to reach our field, the uh, the fuel can you know slop over back into the stand pipes in the wings and give the engine a burst of power. And that burst of power might be the last thing you need because that might then make you overshoot your only field that is suitable for a force landing. So generally leave the master switch on until the last moment to talk to passengers and or if your flaps are electrically operated. Uh, and don't forget in all of this stuff that the, when you go flying, it's a contract between the pilot and the aircraft. And if the aircraft breaks that contract, in other words, you have an engine failure, then you don't owe anything to that aircraft. Um, you only owe, owe it to the people inside to do something uh, to your best ability. So similarly, in an event like this, as soon as it happens in the air, the aircraft also, remember, suddenly belongs to the insurance company, not you if you're the owner. In other words, the aircraft's expendable. The pilot's got to do the best to save the pink things inside it, okay, not the aeroplane itself. So the bottom line is, and as always, you'll hear us talk about this a lot, is to fly the aircraft on speed, in the correct attitude, using the correct angle of bank, and in the correct configuration. So that's a general overview. So let's have a look at some of the initial actions that you should take if you do suffer from an EFARTO. So top of the list there, fly the aeroplane, stay in control select the best glide attitude for the speed ensure that aircraft stays in controlled flight at all times that means maintaining glide speed plus a little bit as we said if you're using more than 30 degrees of bank select and decide on the best available landing area and commit to that forced landing and don't do anything else until you've got that done okay then you complete the engine shutdown, force landing checks if time permits. Remember that that includes things like if you're lucky enough to fly an aircraft that's got a variable pitch propeller, pull that prop pitch to full course. That can increase your glide range. The passenger brief, that's one word, brace. Now is not the time to go into detail as to what you want them to do. You should have done that before you even started the takeoff roll. OK, uh, RT call if there is time. You're probably not going to get a full mayday call out in the time. You might just be able to get a, a mayday call out to say I've got an engine failure and that might be it. OK, don't stretch the glide and end up stalling and really concentrate on your speed control. Don't turn close to the ground if you can avoid it. And certainly if you can help it, not more than 30 degrees of bank. And then when you do get down near the ground, land with land with the wings level and use the flaps as required to achieve or when assured of making that desired landing area. So if we think about some of those things, uh, know your speeds, for example, the best time to pull the best glide speed from the back of your memory is probably not when the engine has just failed. So, you know, it's probably in the checklist. So to give yourself the best chance, remind yourself of the pertinent aircraft speeds before you take off. In other words, as part of your pre-departure work, and in particular during the pre-takeoff emergency brief, sometimes called the captain's brief, or the glided community call it eventualities. What you see on the screen there is, um, is another little interesting thing. That's uh, a checklist from a Harvard T6, and you'll see the speeds are in miles per hour. So if you do fly multiple aircraft that might have different speed um, uh, designations as in miles an hour or knots, then make sure you know what you're flying. And the time to do that, as we said, is during the captain's brief. So that's the general guidance in the event of an engine phone off to take off. But what about some more specific nuances then? So let's have a look at some of those. So what if there are no good options when you have your engine failure? So built up areas, well, not ideal, but sometimes there's no choice. And I know of a couple of airfields around where I you know operate out of where there is no choice. There is no spare places to go. So in this situation, choose gardens, obviously, not houses. <laughs> you definitely want to land into wind at the slowest possible ground speed being the key to survivability. 
and aim for the even the smallest open space to touch down in. It's safer to be on the ground, as we know, and then crash into things, if you like, than fly into things once airborne. We talked about landing on, oh, we've got on screen there, landing on the roads. Uh, there's been a recent thing that we've always uh, recently seen, probably um, uh, with an aircraft landing uh, in the central reservation. In the UK, not such a good idea. There's loads of street furniture around, such as you know, lampposts, light stands, overpasses and things like that. Um, your best option is probably to land one side of the road, you know, uh, in, a, in a field rather than on the road itself. Uh, it's up to the pilot, of course, to select the best option, bearing in mind the important thing is to save the people inside the aircraft with as little collateral damage as possible to the people on the surface. Saving the aeroplane does not come into the equation. OK, next thing then about what about if you were if you uh, if you wear if you fly a retractable uh, uh, aircraft? So is it gear up or gear down? Well, the guidance is, is do what the POH says. OK, but in general, when the surface is known to be firm, then the gear down may well absorb some of the impact or the energy if you come in for a hardish landing. And um, when the surface is considered to be soft, then you might be better off putting the gear up. Um, so, uh, you know, just in case the undercarriage digs in and causes the aircraft to go head over heels. So it, on no account is a decision to put the gear up or down uh, in any way uh, made in order to minimize damage or to save the aircraft. It's all to do with thinking about what the best option is for the people inside. Um, modern aircraft, of course, and uh, in particular down in the, the lighter end of the community have got ballistic parachutes. Um, so should you deploy it or shouldn't you? Uh, well, deploying too low may actually be worse as the aircraft would emit essentially free fall to the ground uh, as the parachute wouldn't have time to open uh, and the rest of the descent rates. So read the POH on the minimum deployment. I mean, for example, in the Cirrus, it's either a 500 or 600 feet above ground level. So don't forget when you are taking off and departing an airfield, then basically what happens is, is uh, you're on the Q&H, so you need to add the airfield elevation to that to work out what the minimum height is for the deployment. I know we had a specific question uh, preempted to us uh, to with regards to ballistic parachutes, so we'll just quickly deal with that as we go. Uh, one of the comments was, uh, should it be considered as a first line of defence in some scenarios? Well, it depends on the scenario. Use the POH and in particular threat and error management. Uh, Cirrus, for example, mandate that caps should be used in all circumstances if you are not able to glide to a suitable hard surfaced runway. Uh, and there's an insurance implication there. If you do try and do a forced landing, for example, in the Cirrus, and it all goes a bit pear-shaped, and you end up doing more damage than you would have received if you'd have used the CAP system or the ballistic parachute, well, that's an interesting conversation you're going to end up having with the insurers probably as well. Um, another comment with, uh, question was, uh, would you use, use a ballistic parachute on the ground during a ground roll towards an obstacle? Well, uh, personally, I don't think that's going to help. Uh, bear in mind the uh, the opening sequence of the parachute also relies upon speed and you're not going to have a lot of that on the ground and also the rocket pack because they are rockets that shoot these uh, parachute packs upwards um you know close to the ground i don't think it's going to uh, going to going to help you at all but again the poh is the one to go by i'm not aware of any uh, zero zero uh, ballistic parachutes i know of zero zero ejection seats but not zero zero parachutes uh, and again, would you deploy it below the operating limitations? Well, many manufacturers obviously say that ballistic parachutes are there uh, and have got their limitations. Um, there, you hear, you will hear stories about people being able to deploy that parachute below um, the stated certification, but um, you only hear of the good stories. There are an equal number of bad stories uh, that can happen when uh, those deployments happen below the certified uh, limits. So bottom line is, I guess, if you're out of options, you haven't got anything to lose. <laughs> but OK, there's no guarantees. And don't forget, you don't hear about the bad news all of the time. Um, quick thing about turning back then. Is that an option? Well, it's never and never. OK. It's highly unlikely that this is your best option, 
Uh, and here's a few reasons why uh, the height loss in the turn back can be significant. And uh, especially if you're not practicing it regularly, uh, the turn required is actually not a 180 degree turn, because if you need to get back to the runway, it's actually 180 in one direction. OK, then another 90. OK, and then another 90 to get in line with the runway. So it's actually the equivalent of a 360 degree turn. The other thing to bear in mind, you'll be landing with a tailwind. So even if you do manage to get enough height to get back to the runway, if it's a strongish wind, you're in for a seriously dangerous landing and a difficult one to judge because we don't usually land with tailwinds. So we give you an example. Um, uh, we, are, we train in a Robin HR200. Uh, the minimum height loss I can achieve uh, in uh, this situation is a 360 degree turn in about 600 feet. OK, and I'm fairly regular flyer, uh, F flying instructor, flying examiner. Um, you'll need to add about 200 feet to that for the startle factor that Matt mentioned. OK, it's quite significant uh, and probably another 200 feet because at the end of the turn, you still need to get some height back to get into the runway. So that makes a total of about a thousand feet uh, in this particular aircraft. And that's including some fairly steep maneuvering, as you can see from the picture there, uh, fairly close to the ground. And that's not for the faint hearted. OK, I'm, I'm fairly used to it. I fly displays and aerobatics down to low level. So, you know, it doesn't really phase me too much. But, you know, you don't want to start filling the windscreen with ground and then try and start to get away from that ground and end up stalling. Uh, and uh, and going into the ground in the wrong direction, shall we say. So uh, the risk of a stall spin then is quite immense in this situation. So if you're not used to doing stuff like that, then don't. You're far better off sticking with your original plan and landing straight ahead or 30 degrees to each side of the nose. Okay, the Skyway code, just to finish with, has got some pretty generic advice on there that we've pretty much all already mentioned. Uh, particularly at low level, uh, focus on maintaining speed and control, uh, providing you keep the aircraft flying, uh, then engine failures are unlikely to be fatal. Uh, if a failure occurs shortly after takeoff, land ahead uh, rather than attempting to turn back, as we've just mentioned. Uh, assess the area immediately in front of you and pick the best place that is likely to cause the least damage to you. Okay. So there's a link in the chat box to do uh, with that, uh, with the latest version of the Skyway code. You probably know it's just been updated to version four. So uh, I've uh, probably said enough on that little subject. So we'll uh, go back. Brilliant. Brilliant. Thanks, Nigel. Uh, uh, just quickly before you dive in, great to see the interaction going on in the chat box. I was particularly uh, pleased to hear that Andrew signing in from Cyprus. Hello, Andrew. Uh, Dale, however, is stuck in the North Sea on an oil rig. So, you know, <laughs> good for you to dial into this, mate. Well done. And really interesting to see some of your stuff that with, uh, people have experienced engine failures and, and how you've got on. So, yeah, it's really fantastically interesting to see. Uh, we've obviously got a, a large amount of people on the webinar this evening. Um, so that sharing of knowledge is really, really fantastic. So thanks for that. I really appreciate it. Right. Uh, Matt is now going to run us through some scenarios so back to you mate brilliant thanks sir uh, thanks Nigel. that's really good if you ever want to create chaos in your flying club uh, just run into the uh, the club room or the cafe and say what do people think about turn backs or overhead joins and then run away guaranteed guaranteed a whole morning of chaos will be left behind you so uh, yeah it's a uh, it's a good one to discuss so yeah so we're going to discuss a few scenarios now and explore how you can consider handling them uh, we'd welcome your thoughts in the chat box as we go or questions about these scenarios in the Q&A box. Before I go into this, though, just remember every individual situation, aircraft and environment on the day is unique. So anything we discuss here is just that. It's a discussion and you should always be directed by your own training skills and aircraft flight manual advice as well. So there is no exam uh, answers for any of this stuff it's it is a discussion um and down to your air personship on the day so uh, let's have a look at scenario uh, one um so uh this is a pa28 uh, those are some uh, enunciator lights or captions as you may call them typically they're 
uh, as you will see them uh, on the panel. Uh, so let's look at the actual question then. We move on. So you're flying a PA-28 and you're taking off. At approximately 50 knots on the takeoff roll, you notice an enunciated caption on the panel illuminates. So one of those lights illuminates. What would you do? Uh, would you A, close the throttle and abort the takeoff? B, continue the takeoff to a safe height and then get the checklist out? C, carry on, because it could just be a transient indication issue? Or D, delay lift off, extend the ground roll and examine the light to see what it is. So there we go, flying PA-28, approximately 50 knots. So PA-28 takes off about 60 knots, so just before takeoff. Get one of those captions, come on, what would you do? Close throttle before takeoff, continue the takeoff to save height and then start any checklist out. Carry on, it's probably just a light coming on. We'll delay lift off, extend the ground roll, examine the light, see what it is. Let's have a look at the results. What do people think about the scenario? Wait a minute. So, the best answer is likely to be A. It could be a minor-ish, depending on the flight regime, problem like a vacuum issue or an alternator going offline. Remember, two of those lights in the PA-28, um, it's a vacuum issue or an alternator going offline. But it could also be an impending engine failure because it could be the oil light illuminating. Probably it's best to abort the takeoff, investigate the problem on the ground and decide uh, what you're going to do next as well. A couple of considerations here as well. Taking off is, is quite a psychological commitment. You're quite invested in it psychologically. And aborting a takeoff often uh, it takes quite a mental leap to do it. I mean, how often have you practiced actually doing it? Have you done it on renewals or your instructor hours? Something to actually think about doing. I had exactly the same in a, a, a Duchess on my one of my MEP renewals, the door popped open. And um, that startle effect we talked about, we trundled down a little bit further on. It was a good few seconds. I was like, oh, oh yeah, yeah, right, bought, closed for all, stop, sorted out. And we uh, closed the door, reset and went off and that as well. But it takes, it takes quite a mental leap. So it is worth practicing. Now, I think somebody put in the chat box as well, uh, about at my airfield, I wouldn't be able to abort and stop in most of the time. <clears throat> and I was I was kind of hoping somebody would pull that up actually as well. I mean, if you haven't done performance calculations correctly um, at your strip as well, if, you know, have you got space to stop? You know, where would you where are you committed? Where um, do you have to lift off and take it into the air? I mean, and this is going to be very specific to where you're flying from and the type of aircraft and the type of flying you're doing. But again, that kind of go no go point might be something that is is quite significant uh, for you uh, there as well. It's something to think about uh, in your in your threat and management uh, as well. Especially if you're very performance limited as well. So that was a good one to start us off. Let's have a look at scenario two and see what people think about this. <clears throat> So in a, in a trusty PA-28, again, we'll get another, another aircraft in a minute, uh, honestly. Um, but we're climbing out in a PA-28, passing 500 feet. You feel the engine spluttering. And you notice the RPM has dropped to about 2,000 RPM. <clears throat> what are your initial actions? So you're going to try and continue climbing to get more height to deal with the situation. You're going to pitch down and maintain at least best glide speed and confirm you've got full throttle. You're going to close the throttle and commit to a forced landing. Or you're going to immediately roll into a turn to turn back to the to the runway. That should be said say just to the runway there or to a, a suitable landing area there as well. So PA28 again, 500 foot, engine spluttering and the RPMs drop to about 2000. You're going to try and continue climbing it get a bit more height to sort things out. You're going to pitch down and maintain at least best glide speed, confirming full throttle. You're going to close the throttle and just commit to force landing ahead, or are you going to try and roll into a turn back to the runway or a suitable landing area there as well. Hoping, of course, you've got a DA and skilled like Nigel if you pick an option B. So let's have a look at the results. Let's see what people thought on, on this one. Let's, we'll go to the results 
first, please. Let's have a look at the poll results. So we've got a bit of a split, 80% continued climbing and all the rest of it. Now, I'm not actually going to suggest a correct answer here. Um, this is what I would suggest is the tricky partial power loss situation here. It's very difficult to give an exact uh, answer for this one because there's so many variables uh, that could affect the situation on the day, the performance, how current you are, how experienced you are as well. So let's look at a couple of things you might likely to consider. It's very likely that on occasions during your flying lives, pilots will encounter a power loss due to non-mechanical failure. The propeller may progressively slow down to windmilling. There may be a reduction in power or degree of rough running. It could be caused by an incorrect selection by the pilot or fuel or an airflow issue. All of these things could give us this partial power loss. It could be carb icing or a minor mechanical or ignition issue. There's so many potential scenarios that could give us this. Very difficult to diagnose and decide how to deal with. So I'm going to offer to you that we have three possible choices to counter a partial uh, power loss, a partial Fato situation. You can either resolve the problem and safely climb away, you can commit to a forced landing or head, or you can use residual power, if sufficient, to maneuver back to the airfield or at least a more favorable landing area. Those are potentially the three outcomes that we could we could potentially do. So how do we kind of wrap this up then into a procedure for dealing with it as well? So if we go to the next slide, please. So this is this is what we think is is how to potentially best deal with a partial apart thing. So pitch down and maintain at least best guide speed, confirm full throttle and assess what performance you've got. Now, we're not talking about an in-depth analysis. This is a case of keep flying the aircraft, as Nigel very rightly talked about, and go, right, what, what performance have I got? If I'm above 500 feet and I'm able to climb or at least maintain level flight, consider turning downwind or maneuvering to a suitable, desirable landing area. And this will answer the question that quite a few of you have been maybe talking about with obstacles or threats on your climb out. You've got to prepare at all times for a glide approach. If time allows, you might want to try and perform some of the non-mechanical failure actions. So you might want to you know, scan around, have I got mixed urich, have I got full throttle, is the primer locked, uh, is the ignition on both? You know, obvious things like that, or very quickly change to another fuel tank, if you have time. If the engine failure fails to recover, you then got to commit and position for that glide approach. And when committed, it's important to close the throttle and perform the force landing. What we don't want, I think Nigel mentioned it, is you don't want the engine bursting back into life when you are committed to that force landing, uh, which is why we need to get the throttle closed. However, if when you experience the partial engine failure scenario, if you're below 500 feet and unable to climb we suggest that is when you need to commit to landing ahead. Close the throttle and perform a force landing as per the total of FARTO procedure. So, like I say, no exam answers on this, but really it's, it's entirely, that's something you can think about. Discuss it. Does that work for you? Are you comfortable with that? If you're an instructor, are you comfortable with that kind of procedure with your trainees, or would you like to put higher height bands on that? Have, have that discussion. Um, it's it's really just the primer. Um, great. We'll ask. Uh, what we'll do actually is ask Nigel because Nigel's got some interesting information uh, uh, on this as well. So Nigel, half, give it half the press, half the press. Yeah, go. <laughs> Here we go. Um, yeah. So basically, uh, partial power is not taught as part of the PPL syllabus yet. Uh, the CAA have just asked various parts of the industry for their um, input and feedback um, and suggestions as to uh, what the, uh, the syllabus should contain for engine failure after takeoff. Um, so I was one of those people and uh, I actually teach engine failure after takeoff as part of our syllabus at our ATO. I've manually, I've actually inserted it into our uh, training regime already. So um, the bottom line is I'm not going to give, give the game away, so to speak, because we <clears throat> need to come back with what they want to do with the generic um, procedure. But the bottom line is, is 
it's not a one fix, uh, you know, one solution fix as all. It depends on your experience and particularly in the training regime. You know, early, early hour students that are just about to go solo, uh, you know, pretty much the answer is you're going to close the throttle and do a forced landing. And that is it. You won't have the skill, experience uh, necessary to try to fly the circuit at low level at reduced power. And as I said, there, there are other options there as well to do with um, uh, partial power in a more general sense, not just on um, engine fire after takeoff, but in the uh, in the cruise uh, scenario as well. So keep your eyes peeled, hopefully. And if your ATO doesn't or training organization doesn't currently teach it, ask them why not? Because, you know, some training is better than none at all. At least you have an, an option there to, uh, to to get on with it in the meantime. Thanks, Nigel. Yeah, great. And David, uh, I think mentioned in the chat as well, <clears throat> knowing at what RPMs or your aircraft will stay level or sink or climb or whatever, that's something that was kind of useful to know. And that's something you may want to uh, experiment with at a decent height uh, on your next instructor checkout or if you're familiar with the aircraft as well and just see, well, if I get this kind of RPM, will my aircraft climb, will it maintain level? And uh, understanding that is a, it's a good, useful thing to do. Right, we'll just move on to our final scenario then. So Cessna 152, we've switched to the, uh, the two-seater on the fleet. Go on, climb out, 400 foot, engine runs down, black smoke, and the propeller is windmilling. What are your initial actions? Roll into a turn to turn back, full throttle, try and regain full power. Close throttle, pitch down to best glide attitude. Turn fuel off, activate ELT, look for a field to land out. So this remember, and I'm kind of giving the game away slightly, the initial action. What's the initial action? I'm just kind of trying to summarize here quite a few of the things we've talked about. So 400 foot, engine runs down, you've got black smoke, but the propeller's just windmilling. What are you going to do? Turn back, full throttle, try and gain power. Close throttle, pitch down to best glide, turn fuel off, activate LT and look for field to land out. So what do people think about this? Let's have a look at the answers. So we're suggesting really in this kind of scenario, yes, everybody's getting the idea now. Close throttle, pitch down to best glide attitude. You've got black smoke, you're not going to uh, try and restart um, that, you know, 400 foot. Is it realistic to try and do anything other than uh, landing ahead so yeah you're getting the idea now of, of how we're assessing these things and uh, and putting it together there as well activating the elt well you know that's that's an interesting point um you know if you're a controlled airfield in that air traffic hopefully will know everything that's going on if you're at some kind of farm strip or you know you may be the only person there there may be nobody else around yeah, activating the ELT may be a very important action for your type of flying. So something to think about there as well. And as I think uh, David Coburn has uh, mentioned there as well, yeah, using whatever power is available to select the best field you can, and then close the throttle. Yes, excellent point, David. If you've got a bit of residual power and it's going to help you to get to a far better field uh, or away from a particular threat or obstruction on climb out, Yes, that would be entirely appropriate. Fully agree with you there as well. Great. Uh, back to Nigel, just to summarise uh, some of our top tips that we've talked about. This is Nigel doing an impression of a person on Zoom being on mute. And now he's back in the game. Click the button helps on the right place. There we go. So uh, we'll have a quick poll to start with then. We're going to build on uh, Matt's, one of Matt's slides earlier on, right at the very beginning, just to test your uh, <laughs> memory. So uh, what's the most probable cause, do you think, of an engine failure after takeoff, considering um, the various uh, major causes that could happen? So is it a magneto failure? Is it an air blockage? Uh, is it carb ice? Or is it a fuel problem? So... Quite a quick answer there, I think, probably we're going to get away with. So uh, let's see what we've got then. So I reckon 
it's more than likely going to be a fuel problem. And uh, let's see how many people agreed. Yeah. OK, so let's build upon that uh, for a little bit then. So let's have a look at some top tips then. And we'll start with that fuel problem. We go for the next slide. So pre-planning is vital. OK, and what we mean by that is, for example, in particular, with regards to fuel, did you get the fuel you requested? OK, don't rely on other people filling the aircraft up uh, and then saying that they have done if there are two aircraft that look very similar side by side by the pumps. Did you, the P pilot in command, did you check the fuel quantity in the tanks after refueling? Did you, the pilot in command, check the fuel caps were secure? It is your responsibility to do all of those things. Um, check your checklist, OK? So did you select the most tank or the most full tank before you did the power checks? Uh, in you know, Do not ever change tanks just before you take off. You, know, you always want to do at least a power check after you've changed tanks before you take off, OK? Um, Pre-takeoff vital actions. OK, so think, you know, some of them are quite important and it's very easy to skip over the little things. If the checklist says put the fuel pump on, make sure it's on, uh, because at low level, uh, if you have a mechanical pump failure and the fuel and the electrical fuel pump is off, you ain't going to have time to recover the situation. So we need the backup there all the time. Did you do a captain's brief? OK, rehearse those speeds. We've mentioned it before. Rehearse the speeds and procedures before you take off. OK, you do not want to have to be racking your brains at 400 feet thinking, what was the best glide speed for this configuration again? You know, you need to think about that before you do it. Fly the aircraft if you have an engine failure after takeoff for real. We keep saying that. Make sure you fly the aircraft. When you do have an engine failure after takeoff, you have not got time to look at a checklist. You have got to do it from memory. Uh, but only if there's time. Fly the aeroplane takes priority. Uh, and don't forget, the checks involve shutting the engine down, not trying to work out what's gone wrong. You will not have time to do that. Um, landing area selection, just as a brief summary then, your choice of field, however unsuitable, is going to be better than the one the aeroplane picks. OK, if you're landing on uh, trees or if there's a, just a trees ahead and you've got nothing else, then treat the top of the trees as the landing surface rather than ground level. And I think that answers a question that someone's asked in the question and answers as well. Um, if you have got trees directly ahead with a suitable field behind, strangely, if you aim for the <laughs> aim for the base of the trees, you may well have enough speed just to pull up over the top and then pop it into the field beyond. But that's the sort of thing you've got to think about before it happens. OK, um, if we've got wires ahead of us, then uh, I always say to people, wires are made for flying under, not over. If you try to go over them, you risk a stall and a spin and a crash. If you go under them, then go close to the pylon or the telegraph pole. That's where you've got the most room between the wires and the ground. OK. So that's it in a nutshell for the top 10 tips. And we'll just go back to Chris now, I think. Lovely job. Thank you. Uh, right. We're going to smash, start smashing through some Q&A now. We've had some pre-submitted questions, which is fantastic. So we'll go through those first and then uh, start getting through the Q&A box. So question one is from Hugh. He says, um, I often do a final car peak check as I line up and apply power if traffic allows. Is that a good idea? Matt, Nigel, what do you think? Is it a good idea? So um, I would um, argue that if you're at a controlled airfield and that, and you've been cleared for takeoff, you need to occupy the runway surface and then get on with it. Air traffic will not be expecting you to uh, to hang around on, on the runway surface doing further checks. Um, except that if you've got a long wait, um, were you doing car peak check if you're identifying carb icing conditions at the hold would be would be entirely ap appropriate. Um, but if you're a controlled airfield and that you could take off, you really need to be getting on with it. If you've got any doubt um, that you've picked up carb icing and you want to kind of recheck it, just you know, just don't accept the takeoff clearance. Say to air traffic you need more time for checks at the hold or, or something like that as well. 
having said all of that, if you're flying on a very performance limited strip, maybe on wet, dewy grass or whatever, you've got no time pressures with occupying the surface, doing a final uh, power check or final carb icing check may be appropriate for you in those circumstances. So quite situational dependent, but um, kind of a routine club controlled type airfield ops, I would say it's, it's not really the time to be doing it. I don't know what Nigel thinks. No, yeah, def definitely, um, you know, a controlled airfield, don't do it on the runway. Matt, I think, you know, it's all down to threat and error management. There might be the occasion when you do need to do that final check if you've been hanging around for some time. But, you know, don't ad hoc it, so to speak. You know, uh, put it in your checklist if that's what you want to do, uh, but do it before you get onto the runway or just before you go on the runway. Make sure you're actually in a configuration to go when you're on the runway. Cool. So it's basically my favourite answer in the world, which is, it depends. <laughs> right then, question two is from Dave. Uh, it's a cold day, five degree uh, ambient with a dew point of four. Scatter cloud at a thousand feet. He's practicing circuits, touch and go. During the circuit approach, uh, he wants to use carb heat. At what point should it be selected cold for takeoff or go around? My favorite subject, and it's another one of those that Matt alluded to when you ask it in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an instructor environment, you can get uh, a fist pipe break out. <laughs> so um, the bottom line is, is the POH should win. OK, uh, in my view. Now, that's not to say that your ATO might modify that for good reason, as we have done. Um, the bottom line is, as I keep saying, uh, is that um, there's what, why would people want to put carb heat cold uh, before they get to the ground? Well, the answer is, is sometimes it's in the POH because the manufacturer is worried about getting dust in the carburetor because when you have carb heat hot, um, the uh, the air is only coarsely filtered before it goes into the carb in the engine. Um, not so much in the UK is my opinion. We don't tend to have hot, dusty conditions long enough to uh, to warrant that sort of thing. The risk is going back to threat and error management every time. Here's the risk: if you come down the approach and you put carb heat to cold at 300 feet. Can you guarantee that in that last 300 feet you are not going to pick up any ice uh, so that when you need to do a go around or a touch and go or just a go around off the runway, for example, then when you apply full power, are you going to get it? And can you guarantee it? The answer is no, you can't guarantee it. So if you get taught that, and then you do everything correct and you put carpet cold and you climb away and you don't get full power and you crash into the trees. Well, you were doing everything correctly. That's the way you were taught. So there's something wrong in my book. OK, if you do it the other way, for example, let's keep let's leave carpet hot all the way until we either touch down or we need to go around. And then you put carpet to cold as part of applying full power. Are you going to guarantee to get full power? Well, the answer's got to be yes, hasn't it? So in my book, uh, the second one wins, <laughs> all right? So how we teach it is we teach uh, carb heat hot all the way to the ground, and you only put it cold once you're on the ground, or you put it to cold as part of the go around. The other reason some people say you should put it to cold during the approach is because just in case you forget to put it to cold, as part of the go around. Well, I'm afraid that doesn't wash for me. That's not uh, a good enough reason because of the risk you run of picking up ice in the meantime. And when you put full power on, you haven't got enough power, what are you going to do? Pull carb heat hot then? I don't think so. That's just going to make the situation even worse. OK, so for the instructors that are out there listening to this, it depends on uh, you know what you want to get charged with. <laughs> um, if you teach someone carb heat hot all the way to the ground, and if they forget to put it to cold as part of the go around, well, that's the pilot's fault. Whereas if you teach someone to do it the other way and you end up with carb heat uh, hot and then you go to cold on the approach and then you run the risk of allowing ice to build up. And if that's the way you teach it, well, you need to be a bit careful about that, in my opinion. I don't know what Matt's thoughts are. Uh, no, I agree with Nigel and Lycoming. If you can actually Google it, Lycoming, common uh, manufacturer. They, they actually put some kind of manufacturer's guidance um, about um, carb icing and carb heat usage. 
and their advice is exactly as Nigel described in terms of uh, you know keeping it uh, on um, uh, until selecting uh, full powered uh, as well. So um, yeah, I, I agree with Nigel there as well. Um, however, having said that, I did examine at one particular flying club, and you've got some instructors berating and lagging students for for doing that. You've got some instructors berating and lagging students for not putting it to cold or whatever. So that's the worst of all worlds in my book as well. You know, if if you whatever you do in your club or training environment, if you're in that environment, got to be uh, got to be standardised. Um, so that students aren't getting mixed messages. That that's the the, the main thing in the training environment. All that as well. So, cool. Thank you. Uh, well, I'm going to dive into the chat box now. So the Q and A box very quickly. Uh, is a good one. What is our recommendation for how often we should be practicing these sorts of emergency procedures over fartos? What would you recommend? How often? Every trip? Every couple of trips? Every month? <laughs> <laughs> and often depends how often you fly, I guess. It depends. Go on, what do you think? So, oh, well, I'll give you. So, um, some of you may know from previous discussions, I fly um, the Grob Tutor, which is light aircraft for, for the Air Force. Um, and we have mandated currencies for practice force landings, spinning, stalling, engine failure after takeoff, and a couple of other things. And we have to complete them. Uh, for practice at least once every 90 days. So that's what the Air Force thinks. So once every 90 days, every so at least quarterly, um, you, you know, you're doing those things as well. Those are the currencies on there as well. So that's that's one guide. Um, but, um, you know, should you wait until your, um, you, you know, your, your two yearly instructor flight? Well, I would argue you want to be doing it a bit more, um, a bit more frequently than that, ideally. Um, but <clears throat> equally, if you're not confident in practicing these things, or you need some guidance, you know, don't do them unless you're confident. If you need to seek instructor or LAA coach or something like that as as well. Great, thank you. Okay, um, here's a good one, an interesting one from Steve. He says, "Should we course on the prop to extend the glide?" Well, that Interesting. general practice, yes. Uh, so if, you know, once you've considered that uh, your engine is not going to be of any use to you, uh, depending on the manufacturer and the prop and how many blades it's got and everything else thrown in, it can actually significantly increase the glide. Um, and then it goes back to what we were just been talking about is that how do you practice that? Because usually when you practice glide approaches in an aircraft with a VP prop, you tend to have it set to fully fine, ready for the go around that you need to do uh, at the end of it. So if your instructor's good, they won't set idle power, okay? So in the twins, that what they do is they set uh, um, uh, minimum or zero th a zero thrust setting. So it equates to, or it simulates a prop which has been feathered, or in the case of a single engine aircraft, a prop that has been set to course. So, you know, your glide in theory is going to be slightly better than you would anticipate or that you would practice with. And that's no bad thing because generally um, there's always a way of losing height <laughs> uh, in most circumstances. Uh, so it's just one of those things. It, it's, it's, it's one of these things you need to think about before it happens and then think about what the best sort of training you can do to go and simulate it as closely as you can. Great. Lovely. Thank you. Um, here's another one from Tom. He says, what's the best advice if there's an engine fire? It depends uh, no, where you so, are. Um, in an engine fire, uh, really, the priority is obviously flying the aircraft. That goes without saying. We've said that a million times already, this thing. But you want to try and uh, get rid of the fuel, which is one of the sources uh, of the fire, really. So getting the fuel off, uh, getting the you know the fuel supply turned off, the fuel pump off, really are are quite good actions. Really, are important actions beyond flying the aircraft. I would suggest. Now, one thing I would just offer on this as well is you need to kind of think about has the fire gone out or is the fire persisting. This is not necessarily just in the Afato case, but perhaps in the force landing generic case as well. 
um, I gave uh, somebody a an engine fire scenario on a test in a motor glider, and um, you know they they we had lots of high motor glider have got good performance, and uh, they basically continued to fly to the most amazing field and do the most amazing force landing pattern, but we were kind of wafting around for quite a long time, and I was I was developing the scenario. I was going, no fire still hasn't gone out. Uh, yeah, smoke's getting a bit thicker. Oh, flames getting a bit bigger. You know, I was kind of giving the hints and the prompts and that. And the point there was actually the priority was to, was to get on the ground. You know, what I really wanted the candidate to do was select full air brake, get down at, uh, you know, speed and get into a field ahead of us very quickly because this fire wasn't going out. What I didn't want them to do was glide around and do absolutely um you know textbook force landing pattern as well so you have to think about um you know as soon as you've got the fuel off is the fire is the fire out you know how quickly uh, do i need to evacuate the aircraft once i'm on the ground um, i don't know what nigel thinks on that uh, yeah uh, I, as you say the important thing is to get get rid of all of the um the, the fuel uh, as in fuel that's going to feed the fire um, rarely you might end up with an oil fire, uh, in which case you also need to try and think about how to get the prop stop to stop it going around. Um, so that's the other thing that gets tested in the commercial test for those of you who've done the CPL. Um, <laughs> whether it's, uh, it's fuel off uh, and then you pitch up to, uh, to try and get the prop stopped and then you want to do an emergency descent uh, down to try and get the fire out and get close to the ground as well at the same time as making sure you end up in a field that is suitable to land in. So it's all a bit hectic, but yeah, the bottom line is, is you don't want to end up burning yourself to death at 3000 feet. Yeah. <laughs> it's better to get on the ground with a broken aeroplane to enable you to get out uh, so that uh, while, while you've got time to do so. And it's also Go. worth thinking about the cockpit fire scenario in terms of when we talk about a cockpit fire scenario, it could, or oil leakaging into cockpit but cockpit fire scenarios people often get fused they're generally talking about electric fires so we're talking about you know um, electrical boxes um going uh, going on fire and smoking as well so it may not be an engine you may get lots of black smoke uh acrid smoke filling the cockpit might not be an engine problem your engine might be working perfectly it might be an avionics box um that, that's on fire as well but it's worth kicking these scenarios around Cool. We are slightly over time. I'm going to do one more question because it's due to flaps. Uh, mm -hmm. Just mentioned about, about flaps, and then we'll close. So, uh, apologies to the audience. We are sl running slightly over, but it's obviously quite an interesting topic. So here we go. Right. Um, so David and someone anonymous has mentioned flaps. So David says, once committed, should you set flaps to reduce stall speed? So hold that one. Hold that thought for a second. And the anonymous individual said, in an Afarso, would you extend full flaps to help the glide? So really. Let's talk about Fartos and when and how should you use the flaps. Okay, so uh, flaps are used to enable you to get to the field that you have selected. That is it. Okay, uh, it's as simple as that. Obviously, you know, more flap you have is going to end up in a reduced landing roll. Uh, you're going to end up um, uh, a little bit slower as well. But ultimately, the use of the flaps is to make sure you get to the field that you've selected. And that, in my book, is the secret. That was easy. <laughs> no, no, Matt, come on, Matt. The only slight counter is that is that scenario that Nigel mentioned about uh, if you've got an engine fire in flight, say on the CPL test, for example, and you've got a little bit of height, uh, what you potentially want to do, say for in something like an arrow, is you drop the gear, take full flap, and dive at VFE um, to get down uh, as quick as possible with the emergency descent. Um, and that, in kind of the engine fire failure situation, that's the only time I'd really need to go straight to full flap, really. Cool. Lovely. Right. Thanks so much. Right, let's move on. And this is the classic answer to get two examiners in a webinar and get 17 different responses, but love it. No, it's good. It's really good information. So hopefully uh, the audience have been able to take something away from this evening. And as a reminder, if there's anything you do want to revisit, the replay of the workshop will be sent to you via email. And there's a list of resources to support you on the uh, website. And also that'll come in the email as well. Uh, once we finish tonight, as always, there'll be a survey that's going to pop up please do take the time to fill this in because we do really value your feedback 
and it's very valuable to us. So, uh, yeah, please take the time for that. If you are wondering what's next, keep an eye out for more details on our social media channels. That's per normal. Keep a look at the website uh, or have a look on Skywise. And if you're not signed up to Skywise, then please do it. It's quite useful. Right. We have run out of time. In fact, we're over time this evening. Uh, so all that remains for me to say is a big thank you to the audience and a super big thank you, as always, to Matt and Nigel, our panellists, and for Chloe working in the background. So thanks ever so much, and we'll hopefully see you all again soon at the next one. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye.